The following program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Time of Grace. It all starts now. Welcome to Time of Grace. I'm Pastor Mike Novotny. According to the guy who almost died in church, my message was not the best message ever. <laughs> a few years ago, I tried to preach a seven-part sermon, and right in the middle, a guy named Paul pff, keeled over in the pew. Now, thankfully, Paul survived, and when I visited him in the hospital, he said, Pastor, a seven-part sermon? Your message almost killed me. <laughs> so I guess it doesn't qualify as the best sermon ever. So what would? What's the best sermon you've ever heard? What's a message that's changed your heart or changed your family or changed your life? Well, today, Pastor Mark Jeske is going to take us back to one of the best messages in human history, a single sermon that changed 3,000 lives. And the best news we're going to find out today is that the same Holy Spirit that empowered and changed lives back then, God pours out on us today so that our lives can be changed too. Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper with his disciples, ending the long practice of animal sacrifice, instead offering himself to people. The Lamb of God made it unnecessary to offer up other lambs. And as they ate the Passover meal, it was intended to be the last Passover, the last supper, but the first Holy Communion. And now God had a new way to interface with us and participate with us and eat together. Baptism replaced ritual circumcision as the way in which people entered into the covenant. And the old kosher food rules were ended. When Jesus accepted the unjust condemnation of a secular court and a sacred court, his own Sanhedrin, he took upon himself the condemnation that rightly should have fallen on us. And so when Jesus was buried, he actually re prefigured and reenacted what's going to happen for you and for me on our burial day and then burst out of it to show, as the Bible calls him, a first installment, the first payment of what God is going to do to bust you and me out of our graves. He went first to show us how it happened. Then for 40 days, he revealed himself alive, not just in spirit, but in body, a body that could be touched, a body that could eat food, chew and swallow fish just like you and me, and Jesus had his own awesome fish fry right by the Sea of Galilee with his disciples, just like in the old days when they used to go fishing. And he recommissioned them to a new and more energetic ministry and blessed them and gave them his message. After 40 days, Jesus left his disciples physically, not to beat them down, not to get them all depressed, not to abandon them. This was not abandonment. This is empowerment. Because 10 days later, came what he had promised, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I want to talk to you about the significance, that last piece of the crazy changes that have happened in just 50 days, how God changed the world and changed the way he interacted with people when God took down the walls of the terrarium and he cut loose the people of God to, instead of coming inward to focus on and to become part of just little Israel. He now turned it inside out to blow it up and send it out to the world. And I'd like you to take your Bible, if you would, and take a quick look at a little piece of the first chapter of Acts with me, and then we'll basically concentrate on a couple paragraphs from Acts chapter 2. During those 10 days after Jesus' ascension, the disciples didn't know what was coming, but they knew they were told to stay put. Don't go back up to Galilee. Don't pick up your fishing nets. Your life is about to change, but you wait until I'm ready. And I wonder if they were waiting for the Jewish festival, what I call Jewish Thanksgiving. All of those things that God did to put like glass walls around his people to keep them together are no longer necessary because now he's busting out. And on that day, in those days, just before the coming of the Spirit, on that Sunday, in the week before, 
Acts chapter 1 tells us in that little paragraph from verse 12 to 14 that the apostles were all there, now just 11, because Judas has committed suicide. But besides the 11, they all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women. There was a group of women, some of whom had come to prepare the burial spices for Jesus' interment. And they had provided support services to the group when they were traveling in their ministry. Jesus' mom was there, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers, which is a really cool little insight. You know why? Because Jesus' half-brothers, and he had at least four of them, plus some sisters, at least two sisters, half-sisters. These would have been children of Joseph as a father. Jesus did not have Joseph as his birth father. His half-brothers, during Jesus' ministry, thought he was out of his mind. They didn't believe in him. They were not believers during his ministry. Imagine that pain in his heart. It, this is the first clue we have in Scripture that his brothers came to faith. Two of them went on to such stellar leadership in the church. They were chosen by God to be writers of New Testament writings and became apostles, as it were. James wrote that sizzling five-chapter letter later in your Bible, and Jesus' half-brother Jude or Judas wrote that little, um, so it's like a long postcard. It's not like a mighty epistle. It's just, it's just a one-chapter burst of intensity right before Revelation. That was Jesus' half-brother. They now have come to faith. Maybe the resurrection is really what finally did it and I, I wonder if they also got a hug with him before he was taken up into heaven. So this is the group that has gathered together and with the other believers, all of the believers in Jerusalem could be numbered to about 120. And you think, wow. First you think, well, that's cool, there's 120. And then your second thought is, that's it? The Son of God was present in Jerusalem for on and off for over three years and that's, that's it? Even Christ Almighty himself was able only to gather that many people? That's how hard this is. That's how stubbornly Satan holds on to people's hearts. That's how stupid we are by birth. Even the Son of God in the flesh is not enough to convert everybody. He had more unbelievers left behind than believers. It was a smallish group. But that's okay. This is all part of the plan because the macro phase was about to begin. Jesus did the micro phase. You know what it's like? is like uh, some of you maybe work for larger companies where the company that you work for will do a test project, will do a pilot project, very small in scale, very intense, very limited market. Let's say they'll do a test market just in one little place and they will lay out their business and see if people respond to what the company is offering. And if you get positive results and people do respond to your new product or your services, the company then may get ready to roll the dice and lay out a big piece of money and build a plant so that you can have distribution all over the country. This is called scaling up. That the company is now ready to go big. That is exactly what God has in mind right now. So this smallish group, the core group of 11 disciples, their close associate women, many of whom heard and learned from the teachings of Christ, Jesus' own personal family, and then a wider ring of up to 120 were gathered together. And the leadership, as chapter 2 begins, was in a house. They were all together. So what's about to happen is not just the 11 apostles. This is that bigger group. They were all together in one place. And three powerful signs took place. A tornado blew through Jerusalem, only it did not leave a rubble of ex-houses behind, what used to be houses. It did not destroy the way cyclones destroy when they come through and barrel through the middle section through Tornado Alley in our country. They could hear the howling of a cyclone, but nothing was being wrecked. Then came fire, fire that identified individuals but did not hurt them. It was not a consuming fire, it was a revealing fire. 
It was a signaling fire. It was a confirming fire to identify you are on the right track. This group is directionally correct, as they say in business. You are on, moving in the right direction. And that fire sat on their heads to identify them as people who needed to be listened to. And then came sign number three. Without having studied, they were able to break into other languages. But not just to show off. Not just as, hey, look at me, I can speak Portuguese. Hey, look at me, I can speak Russian. Hey, look at this, I can, I can say all kinds of stuff in Swedish. This was not a demonstration of power, although it surely was that, not just that. It was useful because they declared the wonders and works of God in the languages of the vast multitude of people who had come to Jerusalem as worshipers who were from all over the Roman Empire. And you get a little bit of a, a census starting in about verse 8 or so through the rest of that paragraph of all of the different places around the world where they came from. Uh, and many of them no longer spoke Hebrew or Aramaic. And now they were hearing the word in their own language. So amazing was this that people who were onlookers, who didn't like Jesus and the disciples during Jesus' ministry, now didn't like those disciples after Jesus' ministry. So they were predisposed not to like what was going on and so had to find some way to poo-poo what they were seeing and so were making smart remarks about, oh, these guys must be drunk. That's when Peter has something to say. So if you would... Uh, now we're going to slow down and, and read a little more carefully verse by verse. In verse 14, Peter stood up with the eleven, no longer called the twelve right now. Uh, Matthias has been drafted to join them. When he is with them, then they'll call it the twelve again. He raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who are in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you and listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. Incidentally, my particular version says these men, but in, in Greek it just says these people. It doesn't say men. This isn't a reference to males. These people aren't drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, I realize now that what we are witnessing is what was foretold by the prophet Joel. Joel had his prophetic ministry. Uh, at, nobody knows for sure because it's, his timing is not linked to any one of the kings. But from the vocabulary he uses and the issues he speaks to, I would say the majority of scholarly opinion is that he wrote in the 800s B.C. So eight centuries earlier, these words have been waiting for fulfillment. And Peter, in his powerful message on this day of Pentecost, is going to reference the uh, prophecies in Scripture about Easter, about the Ascension, and now he's, this first one, he starts with Pentecost first. He said, we should all be, have been waiting for this day because Joel said it would happen. In these last days, God says, last days is a, as a vague, indefinite term that God intends to mean a time way out there when I am going to intervene in human history and do some big, big things. Uh, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all people. And here are two clues as to what's different about Pentecost. How does this show a change of the role of the Holy Spirit from what he's been doing all along for many millennia? Clue number one is pour out. Instead of just dribbling out or slowly releasing, this is going to be a, a spirit gusher, just like spindle top oil well suddenly exploded oil in the US I'm going to pour out my spirit and secondly on all people because your sons and daughters will prophesy your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams that doesn't mean that you know what old guys sitting in a rocking chair their whole life's behind them they're sort of semi napping and they're just rocking they're going hmm yeah remember back in the old days mm hmm yeah, I was some, some young buck back then mm -hmm. and having dreams of the old days. This is talking about receiving information from God to share with the world. And there is no distinguishing of age or gender. Uh, it is for young and old, male and female. And what you are hearing described in poetic language is the fact 
that the Spirit has brought about a complete redefinition of the priesthood. Because in the terrarium days, the priesthood was sharply restricted. You must be from the tribe of Levi and you must be a lineal male descendant of Aaron. Men only. You had to be from the tribe of Aaron to be, from the family of Aaron to be a priest and from the tribe of Levi. In the New Covenant, all believers are declared to be priests. Peter later in one of his letters wrote in chapter 2, you are a royal priesthood. You're also royalty. You're kings and queens. You are princes and princesses of heaven. And you are a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're a people belonging to God, a people He's chosen for Himself. You are priests of God, each of you, with a priestly ministry. No longer do you need Aaron and his descendants as a human go-between or mediator. You may interact with God directly. And you may speak for God when you have received God's words you may pass them on and share them with your world. In fact, not only may do that, you're commissioned to do that. You are called and summoned to do that. And it's for everybody, young and old, men and women, boys and girls. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my Spirit in those days and they will prophesy. All of us are commissioned to personal ministries. That doesn't mean that every individual is entitled to every last one of the positions or offices within the church. Those come through a calling process. And you, that doesn't mean that anybody here can walk up and demand a, a salaried position at any Christian organization. That's a whole different subject for another day. What this means is that you, as an individual in the world in which you have influence, you are not only allowed but invited to and even commanded to make Jesus look good. And your job is only to make sure you know what you're talking about, to learn and absorb that word, to absorb it every way you can so that you can prophesy, meaning speak the words of the gospel and let people know they are loved, let people know that God's favor, this is the time of God's favor, let them know there's hope, let them know there is forgiveness for all. Let them know that Christ brings us immortality to live with him forever. And that message does not self-perpetuate. It is only potential energy. It only does its thing when you and I, sister, you and I, brother, set it in motion. That is a big change from the old days. This is a characteristic of the new covenant, of this big change. Why does this matter? The telescope of prophecy now, Joel has a two-stage telescope. Stage one, click, he extends it out and he can see the day of Pentecost eight centuries ahead. Then he clicks it again and has a look at Judgment Day. Verse 19 says, I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. I see the earth burning. The sun will be turned to darkness. Supposedly, our everlasting permanent sun, which, whose light will never go out, is going to go out. The moon, instead of shining with white light in the night, is going to turn blood red. Something really weird is going to go on as the universe is falling apart before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. It's going to be a horrible day if you're not a believer. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord as right now, will be saved. Those who do not know the name of the Lord or know it but have refused to want to have anything to do with Him will be running in terror for their lives on that day. It will not be a glorious day for them. It will be a hellish day. For their condemnation will be made public, soul and body, they will be joined together and sent off to the pit of hell where the lake of burning sulfur's fires never go out. This is what's at stake. This is why this is such a big deal. You may pretend that that day will never come. You may philosophize over it. You may try to make up your own mental scheme over how the universe will end. But frankly, your opinion of what's going to happen is utterly irrelevant 
same as whether you choose to believe in gravity or not, has no effect on gravity. Gravity will continue to keep your feet stuck to the ground whether you believe in its existence or not. This day is coming. That's why your commissioning as royal priests of God matters. That's why the gifts of the Holy Spirit matter. That's why the commissioning of the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit matters. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So there is hope for us. You have hope that if that day should come today, you will be lifted up and carried by angels to watch the creation of the new world where you will live with Jesus forever. But there are people who have not yet heard that that need to know. And if you and I don't tell them, I don't know who will. This really matters. So let's kind of wrap this all up with a so what. So what? Number one so what is let your knowledge base expand to see what God is up to and understand this great opening up of the hinges of the two covenants. We're watching the hinge today as a new era begins that we live in. Second, recognize the urgency of what is going on here. The great day of the judgment of the Lord is hanging over this planet and it is going to end. Earth as we know it and its history will end and this world will be destroyed. Everything tangible that people chase will be incinerated and taken away from you and we will face our Creator. But thank the Holy Spirit for putting the faith in your heart that you first of all got the information from Him for the Word of God that you and I depend on to fill our hearts is a gift of the Spirit. He is the one to have inspired the prophets and apostles to speak and write down God's holy words. And it's because of the Spirit that you have a clue. Thank Him for that. Worship and adore the Spirit. Look at the gifts you've been given. Another day we'll talk about how to go into a little more detail on that. But you are gifted priests, each one of you different. Each one of you brings something valuable to the game. And you get some of that by looking at what the Bible says are those various gifts. You'll get that from listening to the people around you who can see what you're good at and can affirm you and tell you of the value you bring. If you're a little curious, like, what have I got? Lord, I don't feel very gifted. What do I got? Ask the people around you. And they will tell you where they see your gifts lying. And thirdly, look inside and see where you have a burn. What do you care about as, it re as regards your relationship with God? And celebrate that gift and put it to work and use it as a way to communicate the gospel with people. Because we're running out of time and this is urgent business for the day of destruction is coming, maybe today. And you and I have not reached them all. And we want to share this good news as far and wide as we can. Here's what happened. Three years of work by Christ in Jerusalem only had 120 believers. By the time Peter was done with his just one speech to people, how many people turned to faith that day? Did you sneak ahead and read to the end of the chapter? How many? 3,000 in one day. God's business has scaled up. Do you know today that uh, general estimates are that something north of 2 billion people on earth are believers in Christ today? Possibly as many as a third of the human race living today has heard the name of Christ. Let's try to get the word to the other two-thirds as well. This is our time. This is the age of the Spirit. Jesus hasn't abandoned us. His ascension was not abandonment. It's empowerment. Holy Spirit, come on down and power us up for the next wave. Amen. What if? That's always the question that we ask ourselves when we have the opportunity to talk about Jesus, isn't it? What if they don't listen? Or what if this gets awkward? What if the relationship changes? What if people think I'm cramming Jesus down their throats? That's the right question, except sometimes we answer it in the wrong way. The real answer isn't what happens if they don't listen, but what might happen if they do. What if the person is desperate to hear about grace? 
What if your son or your daughter, your coworker, your classmate, your teammate has never heard this news before? And what if you are the person that God uses to change a life, a family tree, and someone's eternity? To me, that's the most inspiring question. If we have the Holy Spirit, if God the Father has poured the Spirit into our hearts, and if faith comes from hearing the message, the message that the Holy Spirit works powerfully through, what, what if we just speak it? What if we're not ashamed of the gospel? What if we believe it's the power of salvation for all who believe it and that God the Holy Spirit can change the most difficult heart with the simple words that we speak? So next time you wonder, could I bring up Jesus? Could I invite someone to church? Let your mind ask the question, what if? Not what if this doesn't work, but what if it does? Scripture is clear that the Holy Spirit is completely equal with God the Father and God the Son. But all too often, you and I as Christians fail to give Him an equal place in our lives. We want to help you make the Holy Spirit a daily part of your life and start experiencing more of His awesome, life-giving power. That's why we want to send you a book that I wrote called The Neglected Spirit, Understanding and Adoring the Holy Spirit. In it, I show you how the Spirit empowers you to overcome life's challenges, lead others to Christ, and experience victory in your spiritual life. The Neglected Spirit is our thank you for your donation to share the timeless truths of God's Word with more people. Call 800-661-3311, text TIME to 313131, or visit timeofgrace.org forward slash store. We are so grateful for all of you who take your time and your effort and your prayer to support the work here at Time of Grace. The scriptures say that prayer is powerful and effective. And we believe that every time you pray in Jesus' name for this message to reach more and more people and change more and more hearts, we are truly blessed and so many others are too. So thank you. And would you join me in prayer? Dear Holy Spirit, we are so grateful for your work in our hearts and in our lives. Without you, we could never trust in Jesus. Without you, we could never believe in grace. Without you, we would have to guess about God. Without you, there would be no love, no peace, no joy, no kindness, no gentleness, and no self-control. So thank you, Holy Spirit, for working powerfully in our hearts. And now we dare to ask for more. We want more love and more joy and more courage. Help us not to be ashamed as you work in our hearts and remind us that this is not just news, this is good news and this is grace. So would you please fill us and overflow out of our hearts that more and more people could be blessed starting right here at home. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, the Jesus to whom you point us. Amen. With Time of Grace, I'm Pastor Mike Novotny and it all starts now. It all starts now starts now, the time of grace, it all starts now. The preceding program was brought to you by the friends and partners of Time of Grace.